Good afternoon, YouTube. Happy Friday. I'm Kyle, the host here at Med Circle. Check the description of this video for an incredible offer on premium Med Circle offerings, including access to our weekly live workshops, uh, our uh, very robust video streaming service. We're approaching 1,000 pieces of life changing content over there. And you can access it all for free for a week. And then no matter what plan you're on, it'll be 50% off every time, not just for the first month, not just for the first year, every time, 50% off when you use the code available to you at the description of this video. Dr. Thuslam is just one of the most beautiful people in the entire planet. I absolutely adore her. She's a med circle doctor and psychologist. Her voice alone should be, uh, I mean, your voice alone should be monetized, Dr. Thuslam. Well, I, I mean, you. why do you not have an audiobook uh, <laughs> empire yet? Uh, but also her insight on psychology and mental health has really been life-changing to a lot of our members. And so we wanted to get Dr. Thuslam out on our YouTube channel so you guys can meet her, ask her questions, get to know her. Dr. Thuslam, welcome to a YouTube Thank you. And thank you, Med Circle members, for having me. Yes. Now, um, when I think about topics that really resonate with me and you, I do kind of go towards the trauma lens. Uh, and trauma certainly hits on lots of different things, depression, anxiety, stress, etc. When Would you agree that you have a specialty of sorts in that trauma space? Yeah, that's a great question, Kyle. Um, I, I'm not to use the word specialty. What I would say is that most of the people that I work with have histories of trauma. I have a really good understanding of trauma, how it works in our minds, how it affects our spirits, how it affects our relationships. Um, and so I'm well versed in trauma. Yeah. You know what is coming becoming really popular in even three or four years ago when I started at Med Circle, mental health was not discussed so publicly. Now I'm it's even more public. And one thing I'm hearing is two two words: generational trauma. It's one thing that I hear a lot about, and trauma wounds. Oh, I have this trauma wound. What? Can, let Let's go through those. What is generational trauma, and what is a trauma wound? Yeah. So. When we're talking about generational trauma, we're really talking about trauma that's happened not just in our lifetimes, but in our parents' lifetimes or their parents' lifetimes or their parents' lifetimes. So it's it it spans across generations, but the effects of that stay with us and will likely stay with us for generations to come. Um, that can happen for a lot of reasons, right? So from the way that we are raised and from the way that our parents were raised and their parents were raised, we can see the trauma narrative. We can see how the trauma has shaped worldviews, has shaped um, rules, systems, beliefs, all of that. Um, and so that stays with us. And when we get those messages from a young age about how safe the world is, how safe people are, uh, the way the world works, we keep those messages with us and we just see them as reality. And so we can see how from generation to generation that um, the consequences of trauma would stay with us. But the other really interesting and cool yet really unfortunate way that generational trauma affects us is genetically. So whether that's through the stress responses or um, the, the way our, our genes are actually um, written, uh, trauma has an effect on us and that effect continues from generation to generation. When I hear the definition like that, it makes me think that we all have generational trauma. True or false? Good question. Um, I would say yes and no. It depends on what we mean, right? Because the moment we start talking about how we all have trauma, which we do, one of the things that can happen is we can undermine uh, certain traumas. And so when we're talking about generational trauma, it's not just um, the hurt and the pain that past generations have gone through, but it's really the effects of that single traumatic experience, right? And so 
while we all do go through trauma throughout our lives, when we're talking about the effects of generational trauma, we're really talking about how a pivotal event or life situation has shaped the way a person understands the world. And they've taken that understanding of the world and they've passed it down um, unintentionally to yeah, generations yeah. to come. Yeah, really well explained. Why should anyone listen to you, Dr. Thussum, if they just clicked on this video live and they go, who is this lady telling me about my generational trauma? Why should they listen to you? What's your background? So um, what is my background? So I am uh, born in Canada, so I'm Canadian, um, and I am a psychologist. So I have a bachelor's in psychology. I have a master's and a PhD in clinical psychology. And then just for fun, I have a master's in international development studies too. Yeah, um, yeah just for fun. Uh, so, uh, you know, went through a lot of school and have been practicing for a while. Um, most of my practice, as I mentioned before, focuses on trauma. I also generally practice with marginalized and racialized populations um, for whom trauma is often a really big part of, of life, right? Mm -hmm. When it comes to microaggressions, um, mm -hmm. lived experiences of historical trauma, generational trauma, all of that tends to be quite present with the people I work with. Um, mm -hmm. And just being able to see so many um, stories of strength and resilience and survival. Uh, and that's one of the things I really love about my work. Yeah, fabulous. We're going to get to your questions, viewer, in just a little bit. So you can submit them in the comment section that is going off right now. Uh, Dr. Thuslam, let's define what that trauma wound is, though, first. Yeah. So when we talk about a trauma wound, we're really talking about the the injury that's happened as a result of a trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that we can be injured by trauma is so different for each person. And so we may literally have wounds, physical wounds from a traumatic event, whether that was an assault, a car crash, mm -hmm. um, whatever it is, we may wear our trauma wounds and have them be physical reminders of the trauma that we underwent. But then we also have emotional injuries that we go through. Um, and when those are brought up, either um, when we hear a song that reminds us of our trauma, when we go to a place that reminds us of our trauma, um, those trauma wounds may be um, maybe reminders to us, but they may almost be like re-wounded. Um, and so we may feel part of that pain again. Our spirit can be wounded and it may make us really vulnerable to connecting spiritually it may make us feel as though we are alone in this world. Um, and all of those can be consequences of trauma and therefore trauma wounds. Let's go to a med circle member question, please. When we are ready, Rachel, hi, Rachel, piano girl, love the piano. When you talk about generational trauma, are you talking about epigenetics too? For example, my mom is a Holocaust survivor. I think it has affected me in some ways. Dr. Thassel? Yeah, thanks for the question, Rachel. Absolutely. Um, there, is, there is quite a bit of research out there that shows that, um, that the consequences of trauma can actually follow us genetically. And so that is the epigenetic research. Um, now, how that has affected you through your genes is, is a question for another type of doctor. But absolutely, um, the research shows that it, it's quite a possibility. Um, and some of the ways that it can affect us are even through the ways that um, our, our genes are expressed in our personality, in our body's functioning, um, in the ways that our body is able to process stress. Um, and so that does stay with us and is literally written within us. These Q&As that we're doing on YouTube are just an example of what Med Circle members can experience during their membership. Our, our membership is outside of the YouTube platform. It's a more intimate community, and it involves 90-minute uh, sessions like the one we're doing now where you can submit questions and get answers to whichever guest or doctor is being featured that week. We also record those videos and allow them to be played back to you anytime you want in your video library. So when you join MedCircle, you actually get a ton of 
past live classes and workshops to uh, peruse through. If that's of interest to you, check it out for free uh, using the links below or just go to watch.medcircle.com and then use the code SAVE50 and you'll get a 50% off discount if you decide to do anything after your trial. But certainly check it out uh, for free first. Let's go to a- another question. Brenda Cruz is asking, how do you heal from generational trauma when living in a household that isn't ready to talk about it, but you are? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that, Brenda. That is so challenging. Um, and I think one of the things that we can do when the people around us aren't ready is to acknowledge, acknowledge our pain, acknowledge our suffering. One of the unfortunate consequences of generational trauma is that we often end up with an attitude of kind of like suck it up and deal with it. Um, oh my God. I mean, that was the mantra in my family growing up truly was suck it up. I mean, that we could have painted that on the walls in our house, suck it up, get over it. I still struggle with that today. And I think some of it's good. Like sometimes we just need a little resilient. We have to suck it up and get through it. And that's my background in my childhood. But I have to find myself to make sure I'm not doing it in an unhealthy way. Sorry, that was when you said that, it just like really resonated with me. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that, Kyle. And I think we hear that so much when we think about our grandparents, perhaps who have maybe lived through wars um, or, you know, folks from from different parts of the world who kind of see, um, you know, like this. Uh, like these first world problems. Um, and so often that that kind of attitude invalidates the the reality of our emotions and our pain. Um, and so for you, Brenda, taking the time to really acknowledge how trauma affects you, um, how your worldview has been shaped by the lessons you learned about the world and being able to decide what kind of person you want to be and how you want to make decisions that are in line with the kind of person that you want to be. Um, and when the people around you are still, you know, living their life, not acknowledging the trauma, um, it's probably going to be really frustrating. And so being able to just kind of slow down and acknowledge that everyone's on a different path and will take their time to do what they need to do um, and to walk away when you need to, uh, because if people aren't ready to engage in this process, uh, our words are probably not going to convince them and our actions are probably not going to convince them. And I imagine you've tried before. So being able to walk away, being able to know that self-preservation is allowed, um, will probably do you some good as well. Yeah, that's, that's a, a tough thing when, the healing, whether, sorry, let me get my thoughts together here. It, it's complicated because the healing would, in a lot of cases, I believe, be, quote, easier to get through if you had the involvement of other people in your family and or whoever is involved with the, you know, past trauma. So when you don't have that, is healing still possible? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely it is. And but I think we also have to be really real about what healing is. You know, I think people talk a lot about healing as if we're a hundred percent better and our symptoms are completely gone. Yeah. Um, and for many of us, that's never going to be the case, right? If we have survived trauma, then uh we never forget the effects of that. We will still be reminded of that. Um, and it'll still bring us pain. It'll still evoke emotions. And when we think about our childhoods that, you know, we feel robbed of things, even though nothing bad happened, um, that is tremendously difficult to heal from. Um, and our goals, what we expect out of healing also needs to be reasonable, right? And so that's never to say that we won't be able to live a satisfying and meaningful life. But um, for those of us who haven't experienced trauma, which I don't, I don't know who that is, but if you haven't experienced trauma, um, that doesn't mean your life is just roses and butterflies and rainbows. Uh, we all have hardship. Um, and I think sometimes we, uh, for those of us who are surviving any kind of trauma, we we think, uh, we believe that 
once we're healed and we feel better, everything is just going to be happy. Yeah. Happiness is an emotion like any other emotion. It comes and it goes. Um, and so that healing work, um, yes, it can happen, but that doesn't mean we won't be reminded of our challenges and we won't be reminded of our trauma and that we won't still have um, very real reminders through arguments with people or when crossing the street. Um, but the way that we react to those and the physiological response we have to those situations will be much more manageable and so much so that we'll be able to choose what we want to do next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Healing doesn't, it doesn't involve rewriting the past, but it, you know, it certainly helps you write the future that you want. Let's go to a question, please. SF asking, have your views on helping people and ways to help people change from before you studied psychology to now in your career? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Thanks for the question, SF. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I think when I was, so I knew that mental health was where I wanted to be from a very young age, I would say. You probably, did? Yeah. I think Why? I was in grade three sitting in a portable with some friends and talking about how I really was interested in mental health. And I cannot tell you why. Um, I think I just knew from a very young age that this was the path for me. I think being able to listen to people, to support people, for people to know and trust that they are inherently valuable, no matter what anyone has made them believe, is just something I've felt passionate about for a very long time. Mm. Um, having said that, SF, it's a really interesting question because I think, I think I didn't know the reality of people suffering and I didn't understand what my scope was. I wanted to make people better. I wanted to make people happy when I started out in this journey. Um, and I've come to learn that it's not my job to make people happy. And it's not really my job to make people better either. It's my job to provide a space where people can feel safe to trust and they can be brave um, because they know that they have me as, as someone who is trusting to take risks and experiment and try things they haven't tried before and to learn tools that will allow them to live a life that feels more fulfilling and satisfying and one that um, is a life that they choose for themselves. But I didn't understand all of those complexities back in grade three or even when I first started grad school. Um, and so that journey of, you know, just kind of wanting to make people better and happy, um, that's no longer the goal of what I do. Hmm. Really beautifully said. I, I, I do want to go back to this third grade realization of you knowing you want to be in mental health. Uh, I do want to shout out a viewer first who made a, a little donation on our, our YouTube channel. Thank you. That is so sweet of you to do. Uh, and I appreciate the support. I would say, hey, go check out MedCircle, though, if you if, if this is really valuable to you, MedCircle.com. Um, and then this tipper, Dr. Thussum, asked where you went to uh, graduate school. Oh, Back Health 101. There you go. Yeah. So um, for grad school, I went to Lakehead University, which is in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Um, it's a beautiful place uh, by Lake Superior or on Lake Superior. Um, and I lived there for a really long time. It's about, so by car, about 16 hours away from home Toronto. And so it's a pretty small place, um, but a, a good chunk of my adult life was lived there. Okay, we're going to go to more questions, but th this really is compelling to me because most people don't even know what mental health is and they're 34. You were in third grade and you still had this idea that you could help people. You've got to have some insight on where that came from, right? Like you're a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, my I grew up in a home that was very other oriented. Um, and so we spent a lot of time helping other people, talking about how to help other people. My parents um, were born in East Africa. They um, had to leave East Africa as refugees. And, you know, they saw their friends and their family go through a lot. And so when they came to Canada, um, they did whatever they could to help their community and to help the people oh, back yeah, home. Yeah. Um, and so, and 
our community um, took on very much a similar role. And so I grew up with the values of helping people. I remember sometimes my dad would go back to where he was born um, in Uganda and I would like empty out my piggy bank and say, dad, take this money to the poor people. I didn't have an understanding of the complexity of any of that, but that, that kind of voice inside of me that said like, you have the power to do something and you have the privilege to do something. So you better do it. And that's mm-hmm. something that stays with me and sometimes can be problematic for me, but for the most part has driven me to, to want to, to serve other people. Oh, what a lovely thing to hear. Not talking the talk, but also walking the walk, even as a young child. Um, man, what a story, Dr. Thussum. Put that in your book when, you, when you're ready to write the book. When I'm ready to write it. <laughs> yeah, let's go to another uh, YouTube viewer question, please. Haley, she loves life. Is it healthy for a person with chronic PTSD to cut off contact and move away from family who has narcissistic tendencies and refuse to understand PTSD and bipolar type one and two? Yeah, thank you for the question, Haley. You know, it's Cutting people off is a hard thing to do. Um, Some people would call it avoidance. Some people would call it bravery. And I think that depends on the role that people are playing in your life. But you always have the right to do what matters to you first. And especially when we have experienced significant trauma, when we have chronic PTSD, that idea of uh, feeling worthy enough to put ourselves first is something that is is very very hard to convince ourselves of and so Haley if you need to if you need to be away from the people who continue to hurt you or to trigger your trauma uh, then absolutely you can and it's probably beneficial to you um, I think there are some nuances to that as well right and, and I think part of that is being able to decide why certain people are hurting you and to not lump people together. Because the moment we say everyone in my family hurts me, we may also lose the people in our family who don't hurt us or who want to be there for us, but don't know how to be there for us yet. Um, And so being able to really capture uh, who the people are that are hurting you, how they're hurting you, and to, to take action around that without losing the the meaningful relationships and the ones that you do want to keep um, and boundaries. I mean, we could talk about boundaries for days, but boundaries are yeah, really helpful yeah. around that as well. Um, but you have to be the, you have to be the boss of, of that stuff, right, Haley? And so, you know, figure out what me, moving away is, figure out what you want those relationships to look like. If you want them to look like anything um, and figure out who falls into that, kind of category of the family that you're cutting off and who is maybe worth keeping around if there is anyone worth keeping around. Dr. Thasslam, last time we met, it was in a med circle member only class. And the topic of boundaries comes up as it often does. I believe I mentioned that I have gotten pretty good with boundaries. And then you made a little comment saying, well, at least somebody is because I'm still working on it. What is what is, it was something like that. OK, it wasn't exactly like that. What <laughs> what struggles do you find in the boundary space? So, I mean, if we rewind back to childhood um, and that always the case, yeah, I mean, it is always the case, um, you know, this idea of of putting other people first and recognizing my privilege and recognizing the the gifts that I have that I was born with, um, it makes it really hard for me to justify taking time out for myself. Um, mm-hmm. If I know that I can hustle and I can push through and I can make it work, um, then the question comes up of like, is it selfish if I don't do for other people? And I mean, I've, I've been doing a lot of work around this, but you know, this idea that um, it's not even whether I am worthy or not, because I know I'm worthy of care. It's the 
do other people need it more than I need it? And that's the question that, you know, gets me stuck sometimes um, because I know that I can survive. And it's not that I don't think other people can survive, but I know that I can survive enough to help other people. And so shouldn't I? And so mm. that's, that's some of the boundary struggle. Yeah. It's, um, and, and I should even say as much as I, tooted my own horn saying I'm good at boundaries. I mean, only better than I have been, right? Like it, it, that's really what I'm referencing. It's so much practice. And that that's one thing that is overly clear to me now with mental health is that everything we talk about, whether it's a treatment, a therapy, a strategy, a healthy coping mechanism, a communication tactic, whatever it is, knowing it is great. But then there's a practice to it before it becomes even more valuable. Sometimes it's valuable right off the bat, and that's so fabulous. But for the most part, you got to practice these things and, you know, do a little tweak here and a little thing here to make them fit into your unique schedule, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, um, and I know that my clients find this helpful as well, is um, the the way that my boundaries get um pulled and pushed is in saying yes to things uh, and saying yes to uh, helping people, to commitments. Um, and so now I have a rule for myself that if I'm saying yes to like a new project or a new responsibility, I'm going to take 24 hours before agreeing to do anything. And that's just a rule I have for myself because then at least I know I'm not making the decision impulsively. I'm not making it without considering my other responsibilities and I'm not doing it out of people pleasing. Um, yeah. And so that's that's one rule I have for myself. And because it's a hard thing for me to say no, the other thing I try to do is to not say no, but rather to offer alternatives. And so like, have you called this person or have you thought about this strategy? And so that makes me feel like I'm doing something without doing the thing they asked me to do. Mm, I like that. I run my life on a calendar and everything is color coded and blah, blah, blah. But I just switched it so that anything that's not work related is in one color. And the reason I did that is so I can see how much stuff I'm agreeing to. Like I got to do work, right? Like I got to show up here and, and do this and that's great and I love it. But there's stuff that I agree to throughout the week. And then sometimes I get stressed out by all the stuff that I've agreed to. But then I go, Kyle, you agreed to it. I mean, you you have control over all of this. So now in my calendar, I can see in a week or a month, well, how much blueberry color is there? Because that's all the stuff that I've agreed to and I didn't have to. Um, and for me, that really helps see my my commitments that I'm making in a, in a more uh, broad picture. Uh, Bridget, do we have any other uh, questions or comments for Dr. Kyle, can I just jump in for oh my a God, second? Please. Yeah. yeah, you know, I think that's a really interesting idea. And one of the things that I've noticed when when we do kind of take on commitments that we really wish we wouldn't have, um, it can be really easy to jump into being judgmental and being mad at ourselves and talking about how poor we are at boundaries or how like self-sacrificial we are. So and right, to be right. able to just like pause and be like, hey, you know what? You were making a decision in that moment that felt right. And it's okay. And yeah, maybe we want to make a different decision next time. But you know what? You did it because you cared. And that's okay. Um, and to have a bit more of a gentle tone with us than like using, I call them fight words, right? We don't need to use fight words on ourselves. Um, and so being able to just remember that we made that decision for a reason, even though we wish we wouldn't have now, and that it's okay. Fabulous. Fabulous. You know how much I need that reminder? I just, I should take this part of the video and then <laughs> when I wake up in the morning, Dr. Thussum can tell me, now look, whatever you decided to do today, that was you in the moment back then. Uh, really fabulous, Dr. Thussum. Bridget, what was that uh, comment or question that came up? Uh, Nats is saying um, to Betty, there is a massive shortage of mental health professionals, at least there has been in Ontario, uh, since long before COVID. Dr. Thussum, I'm sure that you... Uh, are aware and, and understand that. What is your advice to all of us seeking professionals in areas that have a shortage? Yeah, it's a great question, Nats. You know, I think um, services like MedCircle are awesome for that, right? Because we can start our journey 
on our own. We don't need to wait for a professional to be available. And yes, having the guidance of a professional, having someone kind of hold our hands and tailor a service to us is so helpful, but we don't need to wait for that to be able to start our journey. And so accessing med circle, reading articles, um, self-help books, YouTube videos, those are really good places to start Nats. The other thing I would say is that, you know, there are a lot of um, like groups available, psychoeducational groups, process groups, um, courses that you can take. And so those are also ways to get started on your journey while you figure out, you know, what level of of intervention or service you need to be able to to get to where you want to go. But having said all that, it is brutal out here. I think it's brutal everywhere. Um, And, you know, it's also financially inaccessible for a lot of people. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we do our best and it's it's unfortunate that this is the way the government has decided that mental health services should be accessed. Medcircle.com slash provider or providers. It's one of those. It's a very robust guide. I'm sure Bridget will throw it in the comment section or in the description of this video to help you not not only find the right mental health professional for you or a loved one, but also navigate the insurance, the billing, next steps, which professional would be right for the symptoms you're looking to address. Uh, It's a very robust guide. It's available for free medcircle.com slash provider. And, uh, you know, last mental health month, we welcomed a very large number of members to our database that was last may and it was so fabulous to see all these people join our community you know pop up in classes respond and give feedback to our video series and so again this may we're doing it again with a very substantial discount and it's um it will only be available this month and it does start with a free week. So you're not tied into anything. Try it out for free. See if it's a right fit, you know, watch some classes, watch some series, attend a live class. And if you go, yeah, I could use this for a few months or the next year, use that discount to get it for half off. And if you go, eh, not right now, but maybe another time in the future, no big deal. You don't lose anything. You just get access to another great resource. Uh, there it is right on the screen, 50% off Q&A workshops, doctors, full length series, all of it, watch.medcircle.com. Uh, Dr. Thuslam, so fabulous seeing you. Thank you for being so willing to come on our platform, share your expertise and insight. I'm going to, of course, leave you with the last word here on the video. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much to all of you, all of the members who are here, um, who are on their journey and know that no matter where you end up, you're working hard at this um, and that it is hard. It's allowed to be hard. And so you could use some love and you could use some self-compassion and the best person to give that to you is yourself. Mm, Fabulous. Thank you all so much. I'm Kyle. And remember, whatever you're going through, you got this.